The characters of Genshin Impact each have their own separate and distinct personalities. As such, they all have their own story when concerning the circumstances revolving around how they each receive their visions. In this new series, I'll reveal, if available, the details of how each vision holder of a specific element obtained their vision, and then at the end of the video, briefly discuss whether or not it appears if a pattern is emerging that might help us define what dictates who becomes the allergenes of each element. But first, I'm currently striving to reach the goal of 150,000 subscribers. So, whether you're new to the channel, or you've watched lots of my videos but haven't subscribed yet, please support what I do by subscribing and help me beat the YouTube algorithm and reach my goal of 150,000 subscribers by the end of 2022. By now, everyone knows the story of Kedahara Kazuha, but what you may not understand is that this wanderer from Inazuma was no stranger to the Vagabond's life well before he ever took a stand against the Tenryu Commission and its Vision Hunt Decree. After the fortunes of the Kaidahara family turned for the worst in the years that followed Scaramosha's cruelty, Kazuha found himself in tune with the wind and the clouds. This was a skill he developed over time, while utilizing just a small boat to sail between the various islands of Inazuma over the years. One day, while Kazuha tread along a path, he noticed a small stream of smoke coming into view. Tracing it to its source, he found several small huts. There he requested shelter from the hut's owner, stating that a storm was soon to arrive which was as usual met with doubt. But as the midday sun approached, so too did the storms, and Kazuha was granted the shelter he desired. Resting that night, as the storm continued to rage on, he listened to the leaves blowing in the wind and the drops of rain as they fell to the ground, and he found himself content in this moment, his resolve ever strengthened to be one with nature and the many creatures of the world. He fell asleep that night grasping his sword with peace in his heart. And when he awoke to the sound of birds chirping that next morning, he was surprised to find a shining animal vision lying on his chest. The legends say that all Adepti are known as mighty and illuminated. Illuminated, in this instance, is meant to refer to their third eye, which is better known as a vision. It is not known whether or not the Adepti receive their vision as a reward from Celestia in the same manner as humans, and this lack of knowledge is not helped by the fact that Xiao himself does not remember the moment nor circumstances that gave birth to his vision. For Xiao, this moment is only remembered as the beginning of an endless battle. Liyue today owes its salvation and much of its prosperity to the bloodshed by their Adepti protectors, and this is not a fact that is overlooked by the people. In fact, their bravery and sacrifice is celebrated yearly during the Lantern Rite Festival, as their battles are acted out in recreations, paying homage to them as thanks. Unfortunately, this festival also yearly awakens the usually dormant, residual hate of the gods slain by Morax in the years long past, bringing about an explosion in evil energy, forcing Xiao into action day and night during much of the festival. Because of this, Xiao has come to hate the Lantern Rite, but because it's harder to miss them, Xiao looks each year upon the lanterns, which carry the hopes and dreams of Liyue's inhabitants rising into the sky, and each year, he is reminded of his lonely journey and questions whether he will ever find peace with it or just more fear for what lies in the future. After a couple of appearances between the main story and event quests, it's not a surprise to hear that among Sayu's chief concerns is simply that of getting lots of sleep in hopes that it helps her to grow taller. But in the time before Sayu's vision came to her, her diminutive size posed a significant challenge to her role as a ninja in service to the Shumatsuban, still wanting to prove herself useful, but plagued with the common problems associated with her size, she would encounter above average troubles on even what would be a fairly simple job for others. Time and time again, however, Sayu would still manage to find a way to return with the intel requested in the details of the job. But on one job, she became surrounded by powerful foes, Pushed to a breaking point, wounded and ready to pass out, she had a sudden moment of clarity. Her foes left in utter shock as the small ninja completely disappeared as if she were never there. Seemingly having blacked out following this escape, Sayu awoke to find that the weapon pack she always carried strapped to her leg was gone, but in its place was now a glowing animo vision. With this new strength, she found that she could wield a claymore far larger than herself and was no longer held back by her small stature. This of course was still of little consolation to her overall, as growing taller remains a core tenet of her goals and dreams still today, a desire her vision seemingly has no control over whatsoever. 
As each of the seven Archons are innately powerful, they do not require visions as the humans of the world do to channel elemental abilities. As the Animal Archon and the God of the Principle of Freedom, Barbados wished not to rule his kingdom, but instead to wander it freely, disguised as his fallen friend, the Bard Venti. In this way, he could carry on the legacy of his friend, ensuring that everyone would know the tales of the land and the soft kindness of his voice, with the people being none the wiser. So, to complete the image and ensure that his occasional use of windborne powers would not give up his identity, he fashioned a small glass ball and a frame in the form of a vision, and today wears it to throw onlookers off his scent. This isn't to say, however, that the vision is completely useless. Because he is too lazy to carry a lyre with him everywhere he goes, he uses his godly abilities to transform this vision into a simple wooden lyre whenever the need arises. Jean, acting Grandmaster of the Knights of Favonius, has long been regarded as one of the greatest to ever wield a sword for Mondstadt. But this tough exterior betrays her heart. Rather than being known as the sword that cuts through the darkness, she would rather embody the idea of the shield that protects the freedom of others. With this in mind, Jean was promoted from Captain to Master of the Knights before her vision was ever granted. At this time, several challenges stood before her, the Fatui and the Abyssal Order testing the walls of the city at every opportunity from the outside, and from inside the walls of the city, those traitors loyal to the former Inspector of the Knights sought to bring the Knights down from within. Yet somehow, Jean would manage the diplomatic pressure from the Fatui envoys while commanding the Knights in battles against the plots of the Abyss earning admiration and respect throughout Mondstadt. It's unclear if Jean's vision came to her during battle, but Jean knows the moment well. She felt a breeze flow through her hand. The world faded away, and the time-honored motto of House Gunhilder echoed through her mind. For Mondstadt, as always. Sucros, Knight of Favonius and assistant to the renowned alchemist Albedo, got her vision doing exactly what you might expect bioalchemical experimentation. Ever dedicated to her goals, she was in the middle of her 159th dandelion seed simmering trial. And while this experiment resulted in the seeds themselves being burnt to a crisp, in much the same way as the other 158 trials which came before it, she surprisingly found that an animo vision had manifested itself within the cauldron during the experiment. But rather than pouring out the cauldron and claiming her prize, she decided somewhat unintuitively to relight the fire and let her new vision simmer just to see what would happen. Of course, visions are considered to be indestructible, and this proved to be the case. After three hours, she put out the fire and finally claimed her prize. With the characters from the animal element we've met so far, a slight pattern does seem to emerge with regard to the path which grants one an animal vision. Kazuha, Jean, and Sayu all appear to have achieved some sort of peace despite the common trials of their daily lives and even Sucrose remained excited and dedicated to her experiments despite continued failure over the course of nearly 160 separate trials. Xiao seems to be the exception here, as he experiences only fleeting peace in his role as a protector. While he questions whether the future will ever offer him respite from the memories that haunt him, Xiao continues to read very much as an individual who has lost some part of himself along his journey, and as a result of this he may no longer be the person he once was. If that is the case, I'll be very curious to see whether or not we ever learn the truth of how Zhao's vision came to him, as well as watching intently to see whether or not a pattern of having achieved personal balance, despite unfavorable circumstances, remains at the forefront of contributing factors for other future Animo Vision recipients. And that's it for this video. What do you think of the vision stories of the roster's current Animo wielders? Do you agree with my assessment? that finding peace with one's personal circumstances and striving forwards despite them is a key catalyst in what dictates who gains an animal vision? And what element do you think I should cover next? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell icon so that you are notified when my next video goes live. And if you want to see more, check out one of these other videos. Thanks for watching Tevat Historia. May the seven guide you. Travelers.